we, um, we're fortunate to have our brother Randy um, speaking to us today, and his uh, topic is the glorious sunrise. And in connection with this, he's asked that we all turn to Isaiah 49th chapter, And he'd like us to consider the first six verses. So Isaiah 49, verses 1 through 6. Listen a while unto me, and hearken ye people from far. The Lord hath called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. And he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me, and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver hath he hid me. And said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Then I, then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught, and in vain, yet surely my judgment is with the Lord, and my work with my God. And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob to him, though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. And he said, it is, a light, it is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. So with that, we'll call upon Brother Randy to exhort us on the glorious sunrise. Brother Randy. I don't know how much you and I appreciate the Bible in our laps or in the pew, but today I want to talk about what a precious gift that is and how our Heavenly Father worked to make it possible for us to have it and to be here to meet with it. I'm going to start at a place that you would not think would happen if God intended to give his word to all the world. And that is a, a place that you're familiar with, the Tower of Babel, where he says, they've all become one language, and they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So he's making it so that they would separate because they couldn't even understand what the other person was saying. And that's the world that existed at that time. But then, within a couple hundred years, you see him telling to Abraham, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house to a land I will show you. 
and I will make of you a great nation. I will make a, bless you and make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Quite a statement to make when he just a couple hundred years before that had made it so people couldn't even understand each other. And so you got these nations, scattered nations, all speaking different languages, yet he's saying, in you, Abraham, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. Further, we read in Isaiah 42, speaking about Jesus, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thy hand, and will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. I am the Lord. That's my name. And my glory I won't give to another, neither my praise to graven images. So he's telling the subject of the prophecy, who's his son, I'm going to give you a light to the Gentiles. Again, many nations, many languages. And then from what Brother John read this morning, it's a light thing that thou shouldst be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayst be my salvation to the end of the earth. There's not a corner of the earth that won't hear of God's salvation. Again, a phenomenal declaration when you consider everybody had their own language and they could hardly communicate with each other. All right, so to appreciate what we have in front of us, when you go home, try writing a page of the Bible by hand. Just one page. And it's got over a thousand pages probably. But that's the effort that was required to get the word of God into the hands of the Gentiles. Somebody had to write it page by page into the language of the other people. So we get a hint of how he's going to do this, how he's going to make his son a light to all the ends of the earth. In Isaiah 65, the first verse, he says, I am sought of them that ask not for me. I'm found of them that sought me not. I said, behold me, behold me to a nation that was not called by my name. So the hint is that he's going to call them. He's going to make the effort. It's not something that they're going to initiate. He's going to initiate the effort to call them. All right, so how did he bring it to pass? <coughs> We're going to start at the time of Alexander the Great. You know from the book of Daniel that there were four major kingdoms, the Babylonians, the Medes and Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans. All right, so you know about the Babylonians through the book of Daniel and the Medes and the Persians through Esther and some other books. So we're going to start with Alexander the Great. And I'm going to throw out dates, but I'm not expecting to remember dates. I just try to remember the events that I'm talking about. Alexander the Great, in about 320 B.C., granted religious freedom to the Jews. But he also settled a lot of them in the city of Alexandria, Egypt. Now, you have to say Alexandria, Egypt, because he was had the ego to name a lot of cities in his empire after himself. So there were a lot of cities called Alexandria in the land that he conquered. But the, one, the, most, the most famous one was Alexandria in Egypt. Now, with time, with time, as would be normal for generation passing after generation, the Jews, speaking Greek, tended to forget the Hebrew. 
And so as generations went by, they would have more and more difficulty reading the Hebrew scriptures. But it wasn't, to my surprise, and probably to your surprise, it wasn't a group of Jews who said, we need to translate the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. It was this man right here, Ptolemy II. And he, why did he want to do that? Why did he care about what the Jews wrote? Because he wanted a copy of the Hebrew scriptures in his library in Alexandria. If you know anything about ancient history, the city of Alexandria, Egypt, had a huge library, kind of like the Library of Congress. It was contained all kinds of documents. And so he wanted a copy of these scriptures of this Jewish people in his library. So he's the one that got 70 Jewish scholars from Alexandria to write the Septuagint. You probably heard of that. All it is is a translation of the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek, because that's what people knew. So that was a real providential work that he wanted this to occur. And it did occur because it gave both the Hellenized Jews, the Jews that were taken on the Greek culture, and the Gentile Christians in the area that Alexandria conquered the ability to read and meditate on the Old Testament. The Jews might have had some ability to do it, but certainly the, the Gentile Christians did not. So putting it in Greek gave both classes of people the ability to read and meditate on them. So you're familiar with the uh, first century when John the Baptist was preaching and Jesus and the apostles, and the record of that time is preserved in the Gospels, the Acts, the epistles and the revelation. And they were all written in Greek, not classical Greek, but common Greek. They call it Koine Greek. All right, so the first known, oh, sorry. All right. Alexandria is up there in the northeast, northwest part of Egypt. That's Alexandria. Okay. I'm getting ahead of, getting behind myself. Okay. That. All right. So this Rome had several emperors over time. And this one, whose name was Constantine, wanted Christianity to be the state religion. He was a follower of that religion. And it wasn't the Christianity that you and I are familiar with, but it was a form of it. And as part of that, he wanted Bibles to be put in the churches in Constantinople, which was his capital. So Constantinople is, all right, that's Turkey. I can't hardly see the thing myself. Uh, it's in the northeast, northwest corner of Turkey, it's kind of on that peninsula, if you can see that. But that's where Constantinople was. I think it's, it might say Istanbul on that map, but that was a later name for the same city. All right, so he wanted Bibles in all the churches. So he commissioned this fellow named Eusebius of Caesarea, no, it's not going to help us, to put them together. So after a lot of study, Eusebius decided what needed to be included. And it wasn't really hard for him to decide because at that time, there were multiple, multiple writings from different church leaders, and they pretty much quoted from all, and they quoted a lot from the books that we call the New Testament. So it was obvious to him as he studied which ones that the early church leaders considered inspired. And so that's what he put into his New Testament. And the official list wasn't made until 397, but it included basically the same thing. So Greek remained the predominant language of the Eastern Roman Empire in that line supposed to divide the East and the West. 
But let me see if I can do this. Nope. Okay, get back. Come on. Okay. But Alexandria the Great didn't conquer west of Italy, what we call Italy. So those people didn't have the Greek language, I don't think, in their common language. It's, it's possible that they did because they're part of the Roman Empire, but it wouldn't have been normal because they weren't part of, of Alexander's empire. So they would have mostly speak Latin. So this Pope commissioned yeah, okay. He commissioned somebody named Jerome to put together a Latin translation of the New Testament. Remember, that was in Greek. And later, the Old Testament. And that became known as the Latin Vulgate. Although it didn't get that name until a thousand years later. That's what most people think of it as today. So that was the Greek New Testament and the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, translated into Latin. So when the, okay, that's him. All right, so when the, what they called the barbarians, the people from the north came and gradually, uh, took over different parts of the Roman Empire. They developed their own languages, but most of the countries that developed from the old Roman Empire, the languages of those countries were very related to the Latin language so that they wouldn't have as much difficulty understanding the Latin scriptures as you and I would. Now, England and Ireland, if you're not familiar with this, the British Isles, England's over to the east, that bigger country. Wales is that smaller country beside it. Uh, Scotland's up to the north, and Ireland's that green island. All right, so England and Ireland became safe havens for Christians when barbarians invaded the continental sections of Western Roman Empire in the fifth century. So in England and Ireland, the church people built monasteries and they housed the Latin translations of the Old and New Testaments. And the monks in those, Lat in those monasteries, they spent a lot of time copying those documents and so they would be preserved. They also instructed the youth and did some other things. But England was different from Spain, France, Italy, Germany, etc. cetera, the, uh, the countries on the continent. Because Latin, although it was part of the Roman Empire, Latin never fully replaced the languages of the English people who were, I think they were Druids when the Romans took them over. But they became Anglo-Saxon. The Angles came over in about 350 AD. The Saxons came over in about 450 AD. They were both Germanic peoples, which means they weren't, it doesn't necessarily mean they were from what we call Germany. It just means they were from that part of the continent, the north central part of the continent. And so how were the English people supposed to be Become familiar with the scriptures. They didn't speak Latin. Only those in the monasteries could had a good enough grasp of Latin. So what they did is what some of the Old Testament did. They sang. They would have people go around and sing about Bible stories. They would also have stained glass windows. The purpose of those windows wasn't just decoration, it was to teach the common people Old Testament stories and New Testament stories. They had paintings and they had woodcut prints 
And they also had what they called the pauperum, which means Bible of the poor. And it didn't have words in it, it just had pictures. And there would be 40 to 50 pages of pictures. Again, probably a lot of the people couldn't even read any language, and certainly not Latin. However, the, the churches always taught in Latin. So about okay. Is this no, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Okay. About six seventy five, a monk called Bede, he thought he came to realize that the English clergy, not the, the monks, not the bishops, not the higher-ups, but the clergy, the clergy were the ones who, who would teach the people on Sundays. He said they needed a better understanding of the scriptures. They didn't, they, most of them didn't have any knowledge of Latin. So although they were doing the service in Latin, they didn't know what they were saying any more than the people did. So he translated the Lord's Prayer, the Apostolic Creed, and the Gospel of John into Anglo-Saxon, not for the benefit of the people, but for the benefit of the clergy, so they would have a feel for what they were teaching. And then a, a later king named King Alfred, he translated some other things into Anglo-Saxon. And <clears throat> the most important thing was this priest named Aldred, A-L-D-R-E-D, and he wrote the Anglo-Saxon translation right underneath the Latin words for the four Gospels so that they could compare the Latin and the Anglo-Saxon. All right, so then the problem with England gets to be more complicated because they were invaded by the French. And you might have heard of the Norman conquest of England in 1066. So that added what they call Norman French to the English dialects, which means that the old English that these people had translated for the benefit of the clergy were becoming increasingly unintelligible because you got this mix of French with the Anglo-Saxon. So then there was some effort to translate some of those things into what they called Anglo-Normandy. However, the Latin Bible was still the official Bible of the church, even during all these changes to the language. So then in the early 13th century, it would have been the 1200s, King John of England lost Normandy. So they were no longer overruled by the French, and English became the official language of England. All right, so that's the 1200s. 1300s, you got two major things happening. One is the Black Plague. Black Death, they called it. It was all over Europe. People were dying right and left. About a third of the European continent died off, and about at least that much in England died off. So during that time period, which couldn't have been very peaceful, this fellow named John Wycliffe enters the scene. He studied at Oxford College, and he was deeply disturbed at the ungodly behavior of a lot of people in the clergy. These clergymen were the teachers. They were supposed to be examples, and yet a lot of them are quite ungodly. So he is said to have styled the Pope, whatever, who was a Pope at that time, he was the one who called him the Antichrist and charged him with covetousness, ambition, and tyranny. So the first thing he tried to do with his own energy was to instruct the common people in godly behavior. He didn't want them to follow the examples of the clergy. He wanted them to realize what godly behavior really was. Later, he realized that wasn't enough. They needed their own Bible. They needed to be able to read the Bible for themselves, although the church leaders were very much against that idea. 
So he set about with his own energy to translate the Bible into English. He did have help by somebody named John Purvey, but he mostly did it himself. So again, he's doing it by hand, one page at a time. And any copies that were went out had to be made by hand. But as quick as he could do it, he would copy, he would translate a page of the scriptures, and then I guess some other people made the copies by hand. And there were people, a third group of people, who were eager to get these sheets into the hands of the common people. And these people who distributed these Bible sheets became known as lollards, and they were very enthusiastic about their work, even though the church leaders were very much against what John Wycliffe and his associates were doing. So he took that Latin version, the Latin Vulgate, and put that into English. He did it a very literal translation, word for word. And he, even though the church leaders were against him, he was allowed to die a natural death. He died in 1384. But they were very angry with him later. And in 1428, they dug up his bones and burned him. So they, it's like they couldn't get enough. All right, so that didn't stop his co-workers that he had died. So this fellow named John Purvey, he worked with others to make John Wycliffe's translation less stiff. In other words, if you've, if you've ever read a literal translation, you can get them today. It's difficult to read. So uh, Purvey and his cohorts made it easier for the people to read without sacrificing what the translation was saying. Within six years, a lot of his co-workers were burned at the stake by the church leaders. I don't know if he was or not. I haven't got that in my notes. So then, 1408, remember, Wycliffe's version came out in 1382. Purvey's version came out in 1395. 1408, there's a public prohibition by the church that prohibited the translation or reading of a vernacular version of the Bible without the approval of the bishop or a provincial council. <clears throat> and six years later, the Council of Constance condemned all of work, Wycliffe's work. However, remember, they are made copies by hand, page by page. With all this effort to destroy all the Bibles that were available to people that were his translation, there were a lot of people, a lot of copies destroyed. But when somebody decided to reprint it 450 years later, they found no less than 170 copies, handwritten copies, of Wycliffe's translation of the Bible. All right, so the next major event was the invention of the printing press. Johannes Gutenberg, I think he was German. In 1450, he, oh, sorry, 1455, he printed his first book, and his first book was the Gutenberg Bible which was the, the, the Vulgate translation of the Bible. It was in Latin. However, just before that, okay, there you see Istanbul in the top left corner. Just before that, the Sultan of Turkey took Constantinople and the Greek scholars had to leave Constantinople with their Greek manuscripts, and they resettled in Europe. And I forgot to mention that the brothers whose work I looked at thought there was a group 
among them called the Paulicans, named after Paul the Apostle, of course, who they thought held the true understanding of the gospel, although I've never heard of the Paulicans until I looked at this past week. But the important thing is that these Greek manuscripts make their way into Europe. And what that did was it caused a resurgence of interest in manuscripts, not only Greek, but Latin, later New Testament Greek and Hebrew. And it, I think it was the, the seed for a lot of universities starting in Europe. So you've got that, you've got the printing press, and so you've got more, better material for people to work with. Keep in mind, I should have said this before, when people did a new translation of the Bible, they didn't start from scratch. They took what was available at that time and they looked at the ancient documents that they could get their hands on and tried to see what improvements they could make to the existing translations. They didn't start from just ground zero. All right, so in 1516, okay, let me introduce it this way. 1500s were a very active period with regard to the Bible getting into England in particular. In 1516, this fellow named Erasmus prepared a, he looked at the Greek, the Greek New Testament, and he decided it had some, needed some changes. So he, he put out what he thought was a more accurate Greek wording for the Greek New Testament with his own Latin translation right beside it because he wanted the, the church to have a better knowledge of the New Testament. And he was, he like Wycliffe, was a severe critic of the con conduct of the monks in the prevailing church practices. And he, even back at that early, which is about 1516, he wanted the scriptures to be translated into all languages that he was familiar with so that all the people could read them, even the Turks and the Saracens who would initially have no interest in them. All right, so that was 1516. 1517, over in Germany, you got Martin Luther with his 95 Theses. And he was strongly against the sale of indulgences by the church for the forgiveness of sins. And he denied the Pope's power to forgive sins. And he said, salvation is by faith alone. He based a lot of his thinking on the book of Romans. So in 1522, he made a translation of the New Testament in common German, and he used Erasmus Greek and Latin editions to help him translate it into German. So when we think of English Bibles, France, Spain, Italy, Bohemia, Holland, and some other countries all had translation of the Bible in their language before Henry VIII became king of England in 1509, and when there was no translation of the Bible in English. King Henry VIII was quite a character. Let's see if I, I think I, do we have a picture of him? Come on. What's going wrong? Stuck for some reason. Okay, that's all right. I'm gonna hit ourselves. There we go. All right, King Henry the Eighth. Uh, let's see. Became king in 1509. In England, most of the clergy was not educated in the Holy Scriptures. Church services were still conducted in Latin, and superstition, ignorance, and immorality abounded among the clergy. So if I can get back to... 
So along comes William Tyndale. He was an Englishman. And he was very scholarly. He knew several languages. And somebody in the church told him, we were better off without God's laws than the Pope's. And that really angered him. And he said, I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spared my life, ere many years, I will cause a boy that drives a plow to know more of the scriptures than you know. So he set about to make it his life's goal to translate the Bible into common English. And he realized that he would need to be, leave England to do it because it was not safe for him to do it in England. So he went over to the continent and worked from Cologne, Germany. Cologne, if you can see it, it's in the middle on the western side, the, the left side. That's where he was working from. It wasn't safe for him to work in England. So that's fine, but you still got to get it to England or else it's not going to do the English people any good. So he, he wrote his New Testament in 1529 in English, and they smuggled it into England in 1526. He had to get a German printer to print it. And so a person who was very enthusiastic, his name was Robert Foreman, um, he stored a lot of the Bibles, at his, the New Testaments at his house, and he was later captured and tortured. But the copies of the books were smuggled into England, even so, even though it was very dangerous, people risked their lives to smuggle copies of the New Testament into England. And a little bit later, a couple of years later, they were in Scotland. So the, the church leader said, that's a, that's a bad translation. That thing's got 3,000 errors in it at least. And so Henry VIII, who kind of played both sides against the middle, he ordered the copies of Tyndale's New Testament to be burned, all the copies that they could find. So this is all happening in a short time period. A couple of years later, the church makes a petition to King Henry VIII, and as a result of that petition, he bans preaching, writing books, running a school without the bishop's authority, and keeping of any heretical book in the house. A heretical would be anything that Tyndale wrote or agreed with. So, nevertheless, Tyndale kept working over in Germany. And he, he translated the first five books of the Old Testament and later the book of Jonah. About five years later, 1535, he was lured out of his house through a deceit, a betrayer, and he was arrested. They couldn't, the laws of Germany were that they could not arrest him while he was in the house of his benefactor. But this person persuaded him to come out of the house, and then they arrested him. So one year later, he was executed, but before he was executed, even in prison, he kept on working on translation of the Old Testament. And he made it all the way up through First Chronicles before he died. So his last words, he was strangled and then burned, uh, were, Lord, open up the eyes of the King of England, which was Henry VIII. And I'm ju I'll jump ahead of myself, but within one year of that, there was a Bible that was accepted by the king in England. Uh, okay, so meanwhile, Henry VIII decides he's having arguments with the Pope because he wanted to marry, he wanted to divorce several women because they weren't provi providing him an heir. So the Pope excommunicated him. Well, he says, I'll fix that. No, I'm sorry. He fixed it before. He, said, he declared himself the head of the Church of England. So, <clears throat> meanwhile, there he is. Miles Coverdale and the Coverdale Bible was the first version of the New Testament printed in England. 
And it was basically Tyndale's work. And meanwhile, uh, I'm going to move ahead. This is, I'm taking a long time here. All right. You had the Great Bible a couple of years later. And that was uh, John Rogers put out something they call Matthew's Bible. And he, what he did was he took the work of, of Tyndale and Coverdale and combined it and made it the complete Bible. And <clears throat> then later, there was a, the Great Bible. And within a few years, all of Tyndale's Bible were prohibited in England. Again, Henry VIII was jumping all around this game. And then 1547, he died. King Edward VI becomes king. He's only 10 years old. But his protectors, his royal protectors, allows Bible to be available to everybody again. Then you've got Mary, Queen Mary Tudor. She was a staunch Catholic, and she married Prince Philip of Spain. Remember, they, the ones, didn't want the people to have Bibles. And so <clears throat> she's said that most copies of the Great Bible were destroyed in her reign. She also executed a lot of the Protestants. Over 300 Protestants were martyred during her short reign. She only reigned five or six years. Uh, and that's how she got the nickname Bloody Mary. Meanwhile, over in Switzerland, they were those who had fled from England were working on another translation. Uh, a fellow named Whittingham presented prepared a New Testament. He called it, uh, it was largely Tyndale's work. But the difference, the, thing, the new thing about this Bible was it had verses. It didn't just have chapters, it had verses. And then that was followed with what they called the Geneva Bible, which was largely the work of John Calvin with assistance from Miles Coverdale and some others. And that also had the chapters divided up into verses. It had maps, it had marginal notes, it had charts, it had engravings. In other words, it's the first study Bible that, in English. And it was considered superior to the great Bible. It was dedicated to Queen Elizabeth I, and she liked it. And it was brought over to the New World by the Puritans who settled in Massachusetts in 1620, although the King James Bible was out at that time. The bishops finally put together their own Bible to kind of counter these other Bibles, but it wasn't very popular. It, never, it wasn't popular with Queen Elizabeth or with the people, but they required that the bishops all have a copy of it. In 1579, the Scottish Parliament declares that every household in Scotland, uh, every householder, yeoman, or virgin must have a Scottish Bible in their house. So there you got the opposite of no Bibles to everybody's got to have a Bible. And then shortly after that, oops, King James I becomes king of England. I'm not sure what year that was. I was trying to find it. But anyway, in 1604, the Puritans petitioned him for reforms. They were the ones who were so enthusiastic about the Geneva Bible. And so you got the Bishop's Bible, you got the Geneva Bible, and he being a church person said, nope, the Bishop's Bible, he agreed to do a new translation, but the Bishop's Bible was going to be the basis of it, not the Puritan Bible. And so he picked out 47 Bible scholars and divided into six panels or groups. And like I said, they didn't just start from scratch. They looked at, listen, listen to all these things that they looked at to put together the King James Bible. Several existing English versions, including the Geneva Bible. They looked at Bibles in Latin, Spanish, Italian, German, Hebrew Old Testament, Greek New Testament, other translations and commentaries in the languages of Chaldee, Hebrew, Syrian, Greek, Latin, Spanish, French, Italian, and Dutch. And so they got rid of both words, they called papist words, which the common people didn't even understand. And they also got rid of some of 
the old Puritan words as well. And the result was that 90% of the words were Anglo-Saxon words understood by the common people. They, they made a great effort to make sure that the wording was smooth. They didn't just want a literal translation. They wanted something that where the words flowed one from another. And they also wanted a translation where the, the common people understood the words. So they limited it to 8,000 words from start to finish, 8,000 different words, and it was understood well by the people. In fact, a lot of people for a lot of years, it was how they learned to read, was the, they had a copy of the Bible in their house, and it might have been the only book they had. Now, it wasn't a hit right away among the people, the Geneva Bible remained the more popular version in England for about 20 years after the King James Version was published in 1611. Today, today was the reference I had, was 1993. The whole Bible has been translated into 322 different languages. And parts of the Bible were have been translated into 1,656 more languages. So when you look at your Bible, realize that it was an act of God that made it possible for you and me to have it. He wanted his word to go out to all the world. And I want to close with two different passages. One is we read already, and he says, is from Isaiah 49, verse 6. It's a light thing that thou shouldst be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation to the end of the earth. All right, and the, the one I want to close with is also from Isaiah. And I want you to just listen to this. If you want to open your Bible and look at it, that's great. But... At least listen to this. This is Isaiah 55. <clears throat> Ho, every one that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread? And wherefore do you labor for that which is, satisfies not? Hearken diligently to me, and eat that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make you an everlasting covenant, even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and commander to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that knew thee not shall run to thee because of the Lord thy God, and for the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified thee. This is talking about his son. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. This, he's saying this to the whole world. And let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and returns not thither, but waters the earth and makes it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. For you will go out in joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains shall, and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Now th think about the curse when I read this next verse. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, 
and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Yes, he did confuse the people. He did divide the people at Babel into multiple languages that couldn't even understand each other. But still in his own way, he made sure that his word got to all the ends of the earth with time. Thank you for listening.